Hi everybody, Melissa Klein here and welcome to Cartoon Coping. Uh, this is a class that I'm really uh, so happy and honored to teach and that I'm, and I really am um, grateful that you signed up for this. Because um, so many people, uh, they say they want to do comics or they want to do art or they blah, 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 but very few people actually make the time, dedicate the time and the, um, the, the resources to do it. And uh, I think the great thing about working in this format is that you're a part of a group, that you're not this lone genius toiling away. And I think that's a lot of the reason why a lot of people don't make it in the arts is because they kind of expect themselves to be in it alone. And the funny thing about it is every great art movement has, is if you really kind of drill down into it, it's, it boils down to a group of interested people uh, that are, whether they're artists or patrons or some combination of those things who are just like, oh, this is cool. Let's, let's, let's check this out. Let's do this. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to give you a couple little introduction things. Um, uh, Cartoons really kind of saved my life in comics. And I use the terms comics, cartoons, um, manga, on, anime, like really interchangeably, graphic novels. They, to me, they all kind of fall into the, the category of pictures with words. Although sometimes there's more words, sometimes there's zero words. Um, and, uh, but I first started to kind of do drawings, cartoons when I was around in middle school. I was <laughs> being sent to this terrible Catholic middle school and I felt really powerless. And yet there was something about being able to draw, make drawings of my teachers and make fun of them. Do not make fun of me. I am your good teacher. I'm not. <laughs> uh, that really helped me to navigate that. And then fast forward to when I was in college and I happened to, somebody left this at my house, Lemon Rockets. And I swear to God, this like comic changed my life. The Hernandez brothers, they did I could suddenly see like women who looked, I looked like her, that's Maggie, uh, who looked like me and were real women and women of all different shapes and sizes and these strong storylines. Uh, this takes place in Palomar, which is like a fictitious uh, uh, place in Mexico. Um, and like all of a sudden, like somebody is, writing and talking about and this is funny because this is written by written and drawn by hispanic men but drawn with such love uh and appreciation and showing like all these different types of images of women and it was incredibly it just sort of blew my mind open um and in some ways it just kind of made me feel less alone and uh much more appreciated and also that there are other it made me realize th there's a bigger world out there um there's people I can connect with somehow who, you know, who are dealing with similar things and very complicated uh, plots and storylines. It's the series still goes on today. Uh, I have like uh, almost a bookshelf <laughs> from their comics. Um, and um, the, that really helped me get through. And throughout my whole life, even like doing comics and cartoons and stuff, have always been this kind of thing that I did a little bit on the side that it um, was something that like, uh, you know, I was always trying to make it as a fine artist and, you know, but it was like this little sort of side private thing that I mostly just shared with family and friends, a few close friends. Um, and they were always like, yeah, make something of it. And I was like, you know, um, but fast forward to when I was teaching high school students and I went to my first Comic-Con on my own. And it was like, that just blew my mind because meeting comic book artists and talking to them and just loving like that community and how they were so kick butt because to produce one of these things is incredibly, uh, it's really a labor of love. Um, and how they were both very supportive of each other, but also very quick to be like, that's bullshit. <laughs> and then call each other on stuff. And they were so nice um, meeting all these 
wonderful artists, many of them whom, you know, I I had never heard of before and there they were like at their tables and signing their books. And I was just sort of geeky fandom girling, girl going around like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You know, I didn't even have a costume on. <laughs> but I, I guess I didn't need one. Um, and uh, so all of these things just are really exciting. And so when a friend of mine reached out to me and said, hey, I kind of think you should teach this class. I was like, oh, hell yeah we are dealing with such a weird situation in the world right now. There's, you know, like my world's always been weird, but like, you know, now everybody's world is super even uh, all taken up like a hundred notches. And so this seems like a really great way because there's times that like you can talk and talk and talk all you want. And God knows I talk a lot. I talk too much. Um, but there's something that is really powerful about doing a drawing and that expresses how you feel or what's going on or makes, thing, makes fun of things. Um, there's all different approaches and really this is about what you, what, you know, I'm gonna show you the process. I'm gonna show you how to do this. I'm gonna give you some exercises to help, uh, you know, get your creative juices going. Oh, I hate that phrase. <laughs> make fun of me. Feel free to make fun of me on that one. Um, and uh, all these, I, I'll show you this, but really at the end of the day, this is your story. This is you telling your story. Um, I do really feel very strongly about setting this up to be a very safe environment. Uh, I do not share this stuff outside of it. We'll be recording the Zoom sessions, but I only share that with the people in the class or if somebody's missed a class, they can access uh, you know, the link for that. Or if they wanna review, they were in the class, they wanna review like what that, that was the only time I share stuff is when I specifically ask permission from it. And so, um, so there's that. Um, and as I was planning this class and I've been really thinking a lot about it, uh, I thought I was, actually I was also journaling about it too. And I was dealing with a situation that I, I had kind of like, I, a kind of a very ambiguous situation that was hard to say, like how it was going to turn out. Um, and I still don't really know, but, and I felt like all of a sudden in my mind popped the image of three doors and it felt like I was in some sort of evil game show. Um, I've never been big on those, but I just remember like watching, occasionally watching a, a game show where the contestant is asked to pick one of three doors you know and one door you know and you don't know what's behind every you know any of these stores and you know how this you probably know how this goes where behind one door is absolutely nothing they get nothing it's like still it's just like you know and then behind the other door door number two let's say they're you know, they pick that one and like it's something that's kind of lame like uh, it's usually like a vacuum cleaner or dishwashing dishwasher they're like oh or you know oh thanks like and you just have to kind of act grateful but you're not um in my case that would be like to get a parrot because i think parrots are like i watched a whole documentary that the whole point of the of the documentary was like do not have these as pets. These absolutely suck as pets. Do not get a parrot. And the entire time they're showing these really cool parrots. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I want that. It even began with this woman who was basically hostage to her parrot. Um, she had to like on the weekends, drop it off at a parrot babysitting service so that she could do things like go grocery shopping and talk to her her, her daughter on the phone because her parrot would just not allow it. She was like the slave to this parrot. Um, and she was kind of like, yeah, you know, and she didn't set out to become that. Uh, she never intentionally meant that to happen. A friend of hers dragged her to a parrot rescue place and I guess that was door number two for her. And she's like, yeah, like this parrot and I, you know, Chi Chi and I looked at each other and we just knew it was to be. <laughs> so she was like, they just, you know. Um, so yeah, it's something like that. 
yeah, you get the idea, I hope. Um, then door number three is the grand prize. And it's a trip to Hawaii. It's a home remodel, like a huge home remodel. And somehow, usually a jacuzzi. And, some, and somehow there's an Im implication that the jacuzzi is going to come filled with hula girls. Somehow, like they come back with you from Hawaii and they, you know, and you have a lot of fun. But, you know, like what if Hawaii is not really, I mean, Hawaii is a wonderful place. I used to live there, but like, what if, what if that's not uh, something, a place you really want to go back to or go to at all? What if there's some other place you want to go to? Uh, you know, Europe, South America, look at the Northern Lights, ride the ponies across Iceland. Um, and what if like, you don't have a big old suburban home or don't want one that needs like a remodel so it looks like better homes and gardens. And what if jacuzzis like kind of get nasty for you? <laughs> you would rather go to a spa or something where they maintain everything immaculately. Uh, and then I thought about it. Like, so I draw these three doors in my journal and then I was like, what if there's a fourth door? What if that's the door you build? That's the door that you make yourself and it's exactly how you want it. Or maybe it's imperfect, but it's authentic. Those are those things in that door and behind that door are yours. So I'm looking forward to uh, this hopefully un unlocking that door for you and helping you to create that fourth door. Thank you so much for watching. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing you on Zoom and have a fabulous day.